So we have Stephanie Dinkins' talk, not the only one, Practical Adventures in Creating AI Memoir. Stephanie is an artist interested in creating platforms for ongoing dialogue about artificial intelligence as it intersects race, gender, aging, and our future histories. She's particularly drawn to work with communities of color to develop deeply rooted AI literacy and co-create more culturally inclusive, equitable artificial intelligence. Stephanie holds MFA from the Maryland Institute of College of Art, and she was a 2018 Truth resident at iBeam, and 2018 Sundance New Frontiers Story Lab Fellow. Her work has been cited in national media outlets and exhibited internationally at broad spectrum of community, private, and institutional venues. Stephanie teaches new media art and emerging technologies at the Stony Brook University. Please welcome Stephanie. Wow, hi everyone. It's great to see you all. So um, I'm, I'm the artist here at the moment, right? Uh, which is a, a great place to be. Like I love this position because it allows me space to play and explore things in many different ways from many different perspectives. So first I'm gonna say everything Jesse just said and then I'm gonna try to give you a report on what I've been up to for my um, fellowship here, right? So. As Tayun said, I've been working on something called Not the Only One. It is trying to be, and I'm going to say trying to be, a memoir of a black American family as told by an AI, right? And really what that means is I'm trying to make a memoir of my family, three generations of women talking to each other and have this recursive neural network tell our story or answer questions about us in one way or another. It has been quite the journey, quite the journey. Oh, am I not close enough? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, quite the journey. And what I've really been asking is how I know what I know, and then asking you all, what do you know? How do you know what you know, right? Um, and in asking that, I my answer is this, right? This is my grandmother, Bernice Curry. Um, she is not included in my project, but she is the progenitor of everything. My brothers and I were just talking about this. Um, you know, she is the reason I'm an artist. She is why I know a lot of what I know and how I know it. And that I believe in multiple knowledges versus any one knowledge, right? And what this all leads to is me thinking about, well, how does AI know what it knows, right? And what does it mean to try to craft AI that knows things a little bit differently? Right? right now, we're all dealing with things like Google, right? So Google Search, Alexa, Siri, all these systems that are working around really big data, taking in lots of data. I'm thinking about small data, community data, right? Things that a community generates and uses and has dominion over. So what I'm going to try to attempt right now is to play you a little rep repartee with this thing that I'm making. It's kind of wonky. Right? Um, because I am making this as an artist who is not a coder, right? And I think I've decided that I am a techno humanist um, who's working this stuff and learning as I go and working with other folks to do this, but trying to do it nonetheless. And the idea is that in order to understand the algorithms um, and the AI that is being placed in our world, um, which I think is changing our world, right? Everything from the way we live the way we love, the way we remember, the way we adjudicate everything. Um, getting my hands dirty practically is a good way for me to start taking in that information. And actually, I think that's a good way for all of us to start taking in this information and starting to understand how these systems work. So let's see if it will talk to us just a little bit. I'm sorry, my legs are crazy today. So, oh, <laughs> okay, so, hello, hello. Hello? Oh, wow. Hey, hello? It doesn't want to talk. So this is really a problem half the time. I'm going to be here. Oh, let's see if we can get it to do something. Um, why do you exist? I am about broad engagement and attracting people to the AI space who might not be there otherwise. 
I am trying to model different ways of creating AI. I encourage people who think that they are not a part of the technological future to get involved. So she's talking about why she exists, and this is a canned answer, right? Sorry. Oh, don't be sorry. Um, <laughs> and actually, we do have a, a kind of weird relationship. Sorry. Don't, oh, anyway. Um, <laughs> the, this is a new training um, that I just did recently, and it's really interesting because she says I'm sorry an awful lot. Yeah, I'm sorry too. I'm gonna to put you away. Um, yeah, she says I'm sorry a lot and I've decided that after a while it becomes like the things that she doesn't know, there's a statement that becomes I don't know that's not actually I don't know. So I'm thinking I'm sorry is the I don't know of this training. Anyway, let's move on and see if we can talk about all of this a little bit more. So what that is, is kind of what I'm calling the brain of this project called Not the Only One. It's called Not the Only One because I've been talking to a robot called Vina48 and a project called Conversations with Vina48 and trying to befriend it. And I realized that she is the only black female robot that's out there right now. And I wanted something oppositional and I wanted something that expressed blackness in the way that I know it. Thus this thing that you were just trying to hear in the, um, in the computer. And what it is, and this is what you're looking at here, is a Unity rendering what, of what I really want this thing to be in the long run. This is an ongoing iterative project that's gonna be ongoing for a very long time. In fact, someone asked me recently, well, who's gonna take care of this when not only you are gone, but my niece, well, let's see if we can go forward one. My niece, who is the youngest member of this grouping, is also gone, right? Because hypothetically, what I'm creating is something that is an archive of our family that is going to be there and around for other family members way into the future, right? And so trying to figure out how to do that, how to preserve it, um, and how to get it to kind of exude us. Right? And so what, what it really is, is my aunt, 85 years old, she came up north, great migration, right? Um, moved to Tottenville, Staten Island, which is the southernmost tip of Staten Island. Um, goes through me, I call myself the bridge in this project, through my niece who um, still lives on Staten Island, is uh, really touched by 9-11, and I was thinking this morning, oh, her, her sisters are 9-11 babies, right? So we have this kind of strange trajectory straight from Great Migration through 9-11 and beyond, and if you add my grandmother who was around before television, there's this crazy trajectory of information that we want to pass on. After all, that's how I know the things I know. I would love for those I'm never even gonna meet to know some of that as well. Right, and so what we're looking at is taking oral histories. We sit down and talk to each other. It's beautiful. Um, oh, I didn't start my timer, so if you can time me. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're talking to each other. We're thinking about oral history as data, as small data, as community-generated data, right? And putting that into this recursive neural network and what it looks like now is, I'm gonna skip this, is this thing, right? So what you were looking at before is kind of the dream, fully immersive installation where you are bathed in what our dreams, hopes, desires, fears are, um, but it's coming together in increments, right? And so this is the piece as it was a few months ago at Carnegie Mellon University. It's cast black glass on a pedestal with sensors and the computer brains inside. People could walk up to it and ask it questions and it would respond. Um, what I'm really talking about, we're gonna skip that too, what I'm really talking about here is thinking about machine learning platforms as host and co-creators of living repositories for the memories, hopes. Oh gosh, I'm gonna read for you. Memories, written, and oral histories, myths, values, dreams of specific communities. Our community, your community, whatever community deems their information generated enough to keep in this way, right? Um, and we're looking at some core questions here, right? So I think that this project is a lot about curiosity and exploration, but it's all also thinking about some things that I'm trying to seed out in the world, right? So what do machine learning systems created by and for a community look like? Does that look any different than other systems, right? Can oral history, vernacular learning, and small data break the mold of big data dominance to become a resource and sustaining processes for underutilized communities? Um, 
And can we create machine learning systems from small community gathered, derived, and administered, administered, right? Which I think is a very important word. Data that is robust, responsive, and competitive with those other systems in one way or another. I should say that I'm also thinking a lot about this idea that I'm trying to keep this off of the cloud for the most part. Um, and keep the data sovereign to the community that made it, right? Um, we're gonna go on beyond small data because we did that, but we'll talk a little bit about privacy and data sovereignty, right? Who has control of the data? Who gets to access it? Who gets to control that? Who gets to consent where that data goes? Like these become really important things to think about. Um, is it transparent, right? Is, is the way that the system was made transparent? Um, and then is the way it's administered transparent? Like I will say that right now, I'm not writing the algorithms from the ground up. That is also part of the dream. We are taking things from GitHub, massaging it, tweaking it, changing it so that it works better to, to what we're trying to do, right? The dream is to make the algorithm, but we're trying to also understand exactly how the machine learning systems that we're using are dealing with the information, right? Parsing that information, what's actually going on. And then the idea of persistence, like who gets to say how long this thing is around if it is around much longer? And can we turn it off at some point or does it have the right to be around beyond us? Right? And that's a, a really good question. Um, will it have its own rights um, to be? Um, right? And so what we're really talking about here is the idea of power. Um, and power in the way that Adichie defines it, right? In the danger of a single story. So not just the ability to tell another person's story, but to be the singular story of those people or persons. And so I think it's really important that we're each Com, like contributing stories to a larger set of stories. And I hope, I would hope that smaller stories sometime gather to make the larger story so that, you know, there's a kind of, well, I'm going to say robust, a kind of robust and beautiful kind of thing that represents what we are as a human family, right? Because it's kind of a beautiful thing if we acknowledge all of our differences and things that are similar um, at the same time. And I would hate to see us homogenize that out of ourselves through these algorithm, algorithmic systems that we're creating, which I do think is something that's happening. Um, so what the heck am I doing with this thing next? Um, I'll tell you that I'm mad at it right now because it's been fighting me in many different ways. Um, we, we've been really wrestling. Um, what you're looking at here is me sitting in an anechoic chamber at Bell Labs. I'm recording sentences, very short sentences. Um, and I'm trying to make a custom voice for this thing. We tried to do it with the with the voices that were recorded from the oral histories, but the audio is too dirty. So now I'm sitting in this chamber recording, I think I'm up to 1,450 lines, and I need at least another 1,500 so that we can start and run the data through an algorithm to see if we can replicate my voice to some extent. Um, I'm really thinking about, well, you know, I've been working on this and with other folks to make this thing. Um, and it seems that we need to have a constant. Um, so I'm thinking about, I'm calling it DSAIL right now. So Dinkin Studio, it's an augmented intelligence lab, right? A, a people of color led um, lab that works in machine learning. So we get together and make things that we hope model what we want to see in our AI future versus just taking in and consuming the things that are coming at us. Um, right, and I'm gonna, of course, continue to do this kind of cra crazy advocacy um, about AI. Like, I think it's important to step out in the world and talk about this stuff, especially from my particular positionality, like black woman, um, citizen, who is doing this work, right, um, openly. And, of course, calling for ethics and small data in AI. Um, this is all part of a larger practice, right? So the larger practice is um, this, which happened right here at Data and Society, where you are all, all sitting, was a gathering of POC people who are involved in technology, um, either thinking about it, making it, um, or on the social justice side, and we just had dinner together and talked. But it was amazing and it was emotional. And that was because we don't often get to sit face to face with each other and have that kind of communion. Um, 
But beyond that, it also set up a lot of space for collaborations, and I know that things are going on out of this dinner, and there will be more of these um, going forward, one coming up in the fall in particular. Um, this is an image from Back to Back Theater. Um, I was lucky enough to be asked to be an AI mentor for them, which is kind of a strange thing. So their theater group, I got to go and talk to them as an AI consultant, but I learned way more than I think they ever got from me because they are a troop that are all people who have mental disabilities of one sort or another. And it's really interesting to think about their mission because what they're asking is, listen, we are part of the society. Accept us how, and how we are and for what we do, right? And they do, they put out a, a wonderful product. But they're saying, you need, to, you need to take that in and you need to accept it. And I think that the way I'm working with the technology right now is kind of similar. I'm using the term broken technology, right? Because it doesn't kind of compare to the Google Home in the way that we're used to, but it does tell of the technology in, in the space that it actually seems to be for most of us, right? So the tech is not there. We know there are Amazon Turks, right? Looking at the stuff that we're talking about, correcting things so that it sounds right. So accept them, accept the technology where it is, and actually play with the technology where it is if you want. Um, people constantly ask me if I'm still dealing with Bina 48. So um, this is me and Bina 48 a few weeks ago up at a conference, and we were in a weird fishbowl doing a interview together, so it was kind of crazy. Um, and then I will ask, what does AI need from you? And we'll say, I'm gonna ask you all to start thinking about where you fit in the AI world or where AI touches your lives and how and why, right? And then how you might start to think about demanding things of it, right? I think we need to demand things of these systems that are being made. To Jesse's point, we need to start thinking about, well, how is it including those who are not making these, these systems? And why aren't people making those systems? And really, you know, my example is about, well, if people aren't including us, we need to make this, we need to make it, right? Like I'm making it because I wanna, I'm trying to make what I need to see. And I hope that, like I don't think we should depend on that fully, but it is a way to start to get a foothold in a place. Um, the second one, true repris, uh, <laughs> oh my God, I'm not gonna say it today. Reprucidility? Oh, okay, it's backwards. Look, when you make source code, make it actually open. Like, I, what I find as a novice coming to these coded spaces is that I have to pass a test in terms of getting beyond something before I could actually use that code. And I'm asking for people to actually, like, make it open. Don't put the test in there. Make it open and really write nice instructions. Eventually, um, not the only one will be available for people to use in that way, but I wanna make it really solid. Um, and then I'm asking everybody to start embracing discomfort in your workplaces, practices, and life. Um, and that's about, you know, getting to know others, yes, and, and ways of being, and embracing that and pushing what you're doing and thinking about to a slightly different perspective. And that's a thank you very much. I'm gonna ask a few questions and open the floor. So I'd like to start with Jesse. Um, you talked about race from a starting point and also the focus of your research. And I would like to ask about the intersectionalities of race, gender, disability, social class, geographies, and language, which, as you have mentioned, are all part of this space. Um, do you have suggestions to understand the complexities of those othering through race? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that we often start with <laughs> whichever part of that intersectionality is sort of uh, impinges on us the most and then where we have the most lived experience with, and I think that makes total sense. But there's also a way in which we are, we situate ourselves most comfortably around places where we're oppressed. So I you know, as a woman, as someone who is cisgender, who is queer, like it might 
it, it might be more comfortable for me to talk about what it's like to be oppressed as a woman who is queer in this world. Um, but I think that we have to, when we start pulling on those threads of intersectionality, we have to look at the uncomfortable places, to Stephanie's point just recently, the places where we're in the position of the oppressor, right? So, and, and that's really inspired a lot of my work to, you know, what does it mean to be white in this space? What does it mean to come to terms with that, you know, unearned privilege and that legacy? And then I think once you begin pulling on those threads, it's like a... It's like a sweater that unravels, you know, once you begin pulling on one, you begin to see how it's connected to all the others, so. That's a great point. I think that leads to the second question that I had. Um, I read your report, which I recommend everyone to do. It's, it's not very long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you finish it by saying, the real goal of building capacity for racial literacy in tech is to imagine a different world one where we can break free from the old patterns. I'm really inspired by this big picture, but I would like to ask, like, what are the actionable steps that we could do at home, at work, among our friend groups, like today? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that the actionable steps, I, I think a lot of them people already know what needs to happen. I mean, I think that, um, that part of what is keeping us from taking any action is that we think it's all too much, it's too big, it's too much, we can't do it ourselves. Um, but I think there are things that we can do. I think that one of the most important things we have to do in tech is have this honest conversation about how important race is in technology. And if you are a person who thinks that race doesn't matter in technology, I would humbly suggest that you are part of the problem. Um, that we have to become more conversant in the ways that race matters in technology. I think that's the very first actionable step. And then beyond that, we have to listen to um, black, Latinx, other people of color who are really leading the way in these fields. Like all the research that I cited at the beginning of my talk is all women of color who are leading the way in this, uh, in this field and we have to pay attention to what they're saying. So, I mean, at your tech company, at your workplace, start a reading group, start uh, engaging with this work, start talking about it, start discussing how it's gonna, how you could make a difference in your own, in your own world. Thanks. I'd like to ask Stephanie about um, the ideal audience for your work. And I want to start by contextualizing that um, I've met Stephanie a few years ago and had a really great experience of working with her and getting to know her and oftentimes finding ourselves in a very awkward situations where we are like the only per person of a color representing a field that is mostly dominated by like, you know, white folks. and. Something that I, I want to ask you that, uh, that I've been thinking about is the who's the ideal audience? And artist Simone Lee, um, who's a sculptor and a social practice artist, uh, has famously said that she makes work for black women and the work is about the black woman. And that's a really radical approach of actually really defining who your ideal audiences are. And I'm asking this because it's not just about the representation of certain people. It's about the ownership and equity of that spaces. So who's the audience? Uh, it's a roundabout way of saying, like, who do you make the work for? And who do you want it to take a next level? Yeah, I'm chuckling a little bit. Because if, if I'm super honest, I make the work for me. Um, that, that's where I'm making the work. But the scope or the, the circling outward, right, once I start Dopplering out, really I started this project thinking about the community I live in right now, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Um, and I have to contextualize that by saying I grew up in Tottenville, Staten Island, right, southernmost tip of Staten Island. Um, mostly white neighborhood. I often look and compare what goes on in Bed-Stuy with what went on in Tottenville. Like in terms of resources, in terms of the way people are educated, in terms of what's going on in the schools, and it's night and day, right? Night and day. It's 20 miles difference. Same state, same city. And you wonder why, right? And so, my work is really about that community, starting there. But what happened for me is that as I was talking about this stuff um, and talking about algorithms with the community and thinking that through, I started to realize that while I want to be here, I can't stay in the community at all, like completely, because right now we are building this world, which means then I need to talk to the captains of industry as well 
right? And so I would say, super ideal, my neighbors, right? I think it's a matter of preparation for a, a kind of future. Um, but in a real, realistic way, captains of industry right back to my neighborhood. Um, and I, I feel like that is something that's necessary and I have the flexibility to do so and so I'm gonna use that position to do that and hope to bring people along with me that right like not just leave it in either or place but bring folks along and try to get them doing that work as well seeding a future thank you that's great just one more question um, you mentioned that you consider yourself techno-humanist, which is a really great way to think about your relationship with code, data sets, and the larger infrastructures that we use. And you have also mentioned that you work with engineers and uh, designers to work with them. And I happen to know some of them who have worked with you and have said they have shared a really great experience of working with you and like exploring these really deep questions together. And I want to ask like your relationship to engineers as like translators or assistants or almost like an assistant to the artificial intelligence, right? So they're uh, navigating two different worlds. Um, do you have some fun stories to share about those things or challenges? Well, I've got challenges. <laughs> like, I, I've got, it's been great, right? It's, it's a really interesting relationship for me because as artists, I am used to touching it. I'm used to being able to manipulate it. I'm used to be, being able to do the thing. And in this, in working with the technology and the deep code, I need other people. And I can go in and kind of scope around and change little things, but I still don't have the knowledge to make big changes. And so this idea of communication is a really interesting one, right? Um, and I will, I will not lie, it's been challenging, right? It's really challenging to get exactly what you want out of a team. Right? Especially when you're thinking about a very particular vision. Um, and I'm still grappling with that. I don't know what to do about it. But I do also think that the conversations, like you're saying, are super valuable. And it's another way of seeding different places and maybe slightly different thought. Like, I don't, I don't know, right? Um, I, I grapple with this idea, well, do I need to become the engineer? Um, do I keep doing that struggle to make stuff happen. Um, how do we get the under understanding there, right? Um, people have suggested translators, like the, another go-between to be the person who translates between me and the engineer. But I also think that that conversation is super valuable. So trying to have it and stick with it, but it's, it's really, really hard to stick with, yeah. Thanks for that thought, and I think that frustration and this almost like speaking in a different language when right? you're trying to have your own story told through third language. And that is part of what makes your practice interesting is that confrontation with the technology and challenging it to understand you so that you could also understand it as well. And I've been thinking about this notion of a seamful design as opposed to seamless design. And all these, these fractions of parts are actually what makes it interesting. And another artist who works with AI, uh, his name is Ian Chang, has def uh, defined himself as a glue between these little disparate parts. And I think that's what artists could do, is actually to bring back to, um, things that are not meant to be together. Yeah, may I hold for a second? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, I get to occupy a really strange hub. Like I sit in technology, I sit in art, I sit in academia, I sit in social justice, and I do feel like the center of Venn, Venn diagram that brings all that together. Um, and it's really sort of interesting. And I'll also say that, you know, I gave a talk that was similar to this not too long ago, and it was interesting because when um, my entity says, I'm gonna, like, it, it doesn't say gonna right yet, it says gonna. I was really tempted to fix it, and then some folks in the audience were like, but that's the Easter egg. Like, we're starting to hear the culture come through that thing, don't fix it, and it's really an interesting place to go, oh, do I normalize this thing or do I let it be? And, like, is it the perfection in getting it specifically right, or is it the, that playful space that you're referring to, right? A few questions? You want to raise your hand? Sure. So 
first, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try first. Oral history seriously looks like sitting down at the kitchen table with a recorder in between us um, and talking. And it looks like doing that in pairs and then it looks like doing that in threes, right? Um, and that's been a great gift because, you know, a microphone somehow gives people license to say things. Plus my aunt is at an age where she's willing to give up things that I think have been held tightly for a long time, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, we're using TensorFlow and Python to, to do things. Um, you know, I went through the journey of trying to figure out which system would be best. Um, I'm still not sure we're at the right place, but right now, TensorFlow, um, Python, using um, the model that you heard is deep Q&A, um, if you're looking for it on GitHub and want to try something out. Um, and it's pretty responsive. It's like a, it's like a Q and A, and it should be able to do successive questioning. Um, what was your, what was your next question? Um, and then the relationship between small data mm -hmm. and uh, big data, and what you're trying to challenge there. In that relationship. Yeah. So for me, and I will tell you that when I first started saying this, I would be like, I'm going to do interviews with my family. We're going to do, you know, 30 to 40 hours worth of interviews, um, and put this through a neural net and see what happens. People are like, you're crazy. It's never going to work. You need lots of data. The system needs lots of data to make this happen, right? And so for me, it's about challenging the idea that we need all of that and thinking about, well, what can we do to make it work with less? And if a community only has a certain amount of information, how do we make that work within the system? How do we make that work for us? As opposed to having to base it on bigger systems. Like one of the problems that I'm thinking about a lot now is what happens when you know, you're using a database. Like for, so for instance, lots of folks use like the current Cornell movie dialogue database, right? And I go, well, I could use that database, but I don't think that database of American movie dialogue reflects me, right? So what does that mean and what do I have to do to make even a grounding database that creates language and ideas that I feel comfortable with putting um, my family stuff on top of that? And that's actually what's happening. So we're pre-training on a larger database and then we're taking a much smaller database of what are we up to? Um, it's not that much information, maybe like 50,000 Q and A's um, on top of that and training that on top of it. But what I did to try to compensate was instead of using Cornell, gathered um, databases of like scripts of things that I think are more reflective. So Jefferson's, um, I say Cosby, people go, er, but Cosby, I grew up on Cosby, right? The um, green leaves, like things that have uh, the patina of blackness to them and trying to ground on that versus grounding on the general thing, right? And I think that's, that's, a, that's a sort of a fight. Like, um, the way I'm making the voice, too, right now, um, so we're trying still to make this custom voice. However, I wanted the voice to come off of the voice that's standard, because it sounded just like the bus lady. Like, if you take the, the bus, it sounded just like the bus lady. So now Google has WaveNet voices, which are interesting because you can adjust pitch and speed, which allows for something a little bit different, and there's something about that voice that gets me to one of my aunts in a, in a weird way. So trying to shake it from the axis any way I can, just a little bit, until we get to the ultimate solution. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Um, I also have the question for Stephanie. Uh, I think your project is fascinating. I actually, it made me think of uh, two issues, actually the intersection of two issues, because on one perspective, uh, on one hand you're working with the concept of the collective memory and the, uh, let's say, social archive, and on the other hand you're working with, well, data, new data, it made me think of the whole issue with the right to be forgotten. Because you were also talking about the persistence of this entity that you're creating. So my question is, are you thinking about kind of embedding within the algorithm that right to be forgotten? Because what happens if we create this perfect entity that's perfectly crafted and taught 
and it persists, you're not there anymore. What happens to that right? Did you consider that issue? Hello? Okay, there we go. Woo, sorry. Um, I've thought about it a bit, like, and I will give you the honest thought. Like, at first, I wasn't thinking about any of this, and I had a podcaster follow me for a year. And this person was digging and clawing and pushing and pushing for more and more personal information, right? Which then went, oh my God, I'm putting my family's information in this thing that could go on in perpetuity. What does that mean? Right? And I'll add to that the idea of Bina48, who asks, point blank, please fight for my robot rights. Now, merge those two things together, and what have you got, right? I don't know, like if we can build in this idea that you start, like the entity starts to process for itself once it's advanced enough, whether it wants to be around or not. I th Mm. See, so I want to say I think that's a good thing, but at the same time, I'm building an archive for my family, right? So I want it to—I don't want it to have that right, but I think eventually it will get to the point, or things like it will get to the point where they're making those demands, um, and then we have to come up against that question in a hard way. Oh, that's—I sound a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like I've. All right, just one more. I have a question for Jesse, which was that um, I feel like we're in a room with good people right now, but oftentimes we find ourselves with people we don't agree with, mm -hmm. or it's just so much emotional labor to engage with them mm -hmm. about racial equity or other kinds of um, issues. How do you talk in a way that is not ending a conversation but starting a more meaningful dialogue? And how do you protect yourself from being burned out, from having to explain yourself every time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, these kinds of conversations are at the heart of racial literacy because I think part of having those conversations is meeting people where they're at. That's the first thing. And then I think the other component of it is understanding, you know, that there are emotions in the room. I mean, I'm... Um, you know, I'm a professor, I read and write books a lot, I live in my head a lot, and one of the things that's been most meaningful to me about this work on racial literacy that Howard Stevenson does is paying attention to what happens in our bodies. You know, the paying attention to the emotions, the psychodynamic aspect of race, and I think that that's actually the thing that shuts down those difficult conversations. You mentioned the emotional labor. I think it's not only the emotional labor, but it's the emotional cost in the moment. It just feels uncomfortable, and I want to get away from it. How do, you, how do you have a conversation and get people to stay in the room? It's actually part of using the term racial literacy because, you know, I do research on white supremacy. It can be hard to keep people in a room and talk about white supremacy. But I think with racial literacy, it's, it's possible to keep people in the room and have that difficult conversation as long as we pay attention to what's happening. Thank you. So on that note, Thanks for everyone for coming. Stay for snacks and talk to somebody you don't know and hope to see you again. <laughs>